Welcome to the program. My name is Marty Shankman, and uh, we have a great presentation, I hope, and a great panel. I'm joined by the illustrious Jonathan Blotmacher and by Teresa Bush from Interactive Legal. And we're going to have a special word from our, a charitable sponsor, Veronique, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, from a, a wonderful organization, the Michael J. Fox Foundation, which I will plug again mercilessly in a moment. So our topic today, uh, and we're going to try to keep it very practical, how-to, and relevant to what's going on in late 2020. But if you're turning in after 2020, all the information will be still relevant, uh, but for not knowing what uh, or whether there's any change in tax legislation. But we're going to focus on what practitioners need to do with grants, grant to retained annuity trusts, in late 2020. There's our disclaimer. A couple quick points before we start. Uh, the PowerPoint is available to you um, on the web console. So if you click on the handout tab and open it up, you can download while you're watching the PowerPoint. Um, we have posted the PowerPoint to shankmanlaw.com on the main page and in the um, uh, invitation or reminder for signing in, that has a link to that as well. And uh, we post all of the uh, webinars to shankmanlaw.com under the webinar tab with handout materials. Uh, and the handout materials will include not only the PowerPoint, but an article Jonathan and I did for, I, I, I think it's called Action Line, but it's like the Florida Bar Journal. Jonathan, I don't know if you remember better than that, but it was a, it was a pretty detailed article about grant planning in 2020, which is our topic. And just by the way, there's about 150 or more webinars, um, video clips on laweasy.com if you want 10 minute or shorter planning clips. Uh, Jonathan did at least 25 or 30 of those with me, uh, and there's a growing library of 50 plus plus uh, webinars recorded on Shankman Law, which you can access. I don't know why people keep asking, but there is, we do not formally give CLE or CPE. We give you a certificate, which will get emailed to you uh, for those that want to self-report or use that. If you have any questions, the best thing is to email Jonathan, Teresa, or I. Um, our email addresses are all on the um, uh, last slide. Um, don't post questions to the web console because it's just too difficult to do that. So hopefully that's answered any questions. Now, we have two wonderful sponsors for today, and I will turn it over to Teresa to plug the first one. Teresa, it's all yours. Absolutely. Thanks, Marty. Yep, my name is Teresa Bush, and I am the Director of Education and Support Services for Interactive Legal. We are always interested in bringing good substantive content to as many estate planning attorneys as we can, and we're very pleased that uh, we get to be a part of this presentation. Marty is, of course, one of our advisors, and Jonathan is our Editor-in-Chief and Founder of Interactive Legal, which uh, you know, one thing we do, in addition to providing the educational content, is produce a drafting system for lawyers where you can draft, of course, graphs like we're going to be talking about today, and then also estate planning documents in general, everything from very simple all the way up to planning for uh, generations getting transfer tax planning and all kinds of estate tax issues, which of course are top of mind here at the end of 2020. So thank you, Marty, for the opportunity to be here. Uh, we appreciate the ability to bring this content to this audience. And our second sponsor is Peak Trust Company, which has offices in uh, Alaska and Nevada, two of the very trust-friendly states. Jonathan, do you want to give a plug? I don't know that Nicole Oh, I'm it. here. Oh, I'm on. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I'm Jonathan, here. Yay. Jonathan, you're upstaged. We got Nicole. Go <laughs> for it, Nicole. Well, thank you, Marty. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar. Um, I am Nicole King, and I'm a trust officer here at Peak Trust Company. And as always, we're pleased and honored to be able to sponsor today's presentation. Um, just to tell you a little bit about Peak Trust, we've been in business for over 20 years. And as Marty said, we have offices in both Alaska and Nevada. We're a full service trust company and we offer flexible and customized administrative services for all types of trusts. So uh, please, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact myself or any member of our team. Um, you can find our information on the deck right there, um, or you can visit our website at www.peaktrust.com. And with this, I'll turn it back over to today's pre presenters. Thank you. So quick plug for, for Peak and Interactive with the, the, the incredible rush and crush of planning at the end of 2020. Using a document generation system, to me, is, is the only 
efficient way to generate the volume of documents uh, and, and to make them not um, uh, copy jobs, but to be able to tailor them fairly specifically for each client situation. Document generation software is incredible for that. Um, we, Jonathan and I have several different SLAT Sponsor Lifetime Access webinars on my website. Those are on the peak and interactive websites as well if you want them. And just a quick point, one of the ways that we talked about differentiating a non-reciprocal Sponsor Lifetime Access Trust is by having time between them, doing one in 2019, one in 2020, having a lot of time between them, so on and so forth. Cannot do that really in the waning days of 2020. So the, the part of the answer, I think, is that you put one trust in one jurisdiction like Alaska, one in another jurisdiction like Nevada, where there's substantive, substantive differences in, in law, and uh, you can use interactive to draft those and peak to help you. So that's just a practical application. Now, our last quick plug and sponsor until we, we're gonna then dive in is um, uh, every time I do a webinar, I try to, um, uh, I don't know if promote is the right word, but tell everybody um, in the audience about a, a great charity. We've covered probably a dozen different charities over the last few years. We've been doing this more than a dozen. And um, today I want to introduce you to, if you do not know, the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's Research, who I've been uh, endeavoring to help for many, many years. I wrote a book for them on fundraising for uh, Parkinson's Research many years ago. And it's really, truly an incredible, wonderful organization. And even if you don't feel connected to Parkinson's, the incredible research that they fund um, can have incredible ripple effects and benefits to other types of um, uh, brain disease and chronic disease uh, research. Um, I hope I say it right, Veronique, did I get yeah, close? Thank you. Yeah, perfect. And so, thank you for um, inviting us and for, for being such a supporter. And thanks to everyone in the audience for the work that you do that's so helpful to so many organizations. Um, so Parkinson's is the fastest growing of the neurological disorders by, um, 2040, it's expected to double to 13 million people. So it's really a far, far reaching concern that has um, a negative potential of impacting a tremendous amount of lives. Um, we believe at the Fox Foundation that it's our obligation to continue building on the current research momentum, which is huge actually. And we support scientific studies that lead to better treatments and ultimately a cure. And we do this with a pretty revolutionary business model. Um, or not revolutionary, it's incredibly collaborative. Um, and it seems like every organization should do that, but we've really been able to see the impact of combine, combining um, the skills, like the business strategy with um, scientific rigor so that we can accelerate a cure and, and get to new treatments faster. Um, we hold no endowment or excess financial reserves. We try and spend the money on research in the year that we raise it uh, because we feel the sense of urgency and a efficiency for people who are living with this disease and there's so much potential. Tremendous progress is happening. I'm gonna keep this very brief, but uh, in, the last, um, in the last two years we have funded, uh, or the, the FDA has approved eight new drugs for motor and non-motor symptoms, two deep brain stimulation systems, three new treatments to manage off episodes. The therapeutic development pipeline has never been more robust and um, we are grateful for the role that we are able to, to play in, in filling it and keeping it moving forward. Um, in tandem with our work on symptomatic treatments, which continues, our priority remains obviously the holy grail is disease modifying treatments, therapies that will slow, stop or reverse the progression of Parkinson's disease. And I'm so, um, I, I've been with the organization almost 20 years and I am so heartwarmed to see kind of the paradigm shift and the incredible reveal that's happening in this aspect of our research. We are getting so close to the heart of what sets Parkinson's in motion. And we have uh, so many studies in clinical trials that are about breaking down the misfolded proteins and working through the genetic processes that are involved and implicated in setting Parkinson's in motion and in hurting those dopamine neurons and starting that cycle. And, and we, we feel on the brink of reversing it, which feels um, very, very hopeful. Um, and as more compounds are advancing into clinical trials, as I suggested, we also realize that the, a field-wide challenge is having a way to measure these successes through a biomarker. And so we have a huge um, study called the Parkinson's Progression Mar Markers Initiative, 
Uh, we This study has been downloaded over 6 million times. We have um, 1,500 volunteers. They give samples, and we are raising that to 4,000 volunteers, hopefully in the next couple of years. And that big data is very valuable to science. Big data in biology is important, and we also um, look at big data in patient reported outcomes. And we started a observational study called Fox Insight, where 50,000 people have the opportunity to fill out surveys every 90 days about their lived experience with Parkinson's. So we try and come at it from every possible angle to improve the lives of people with PD. We have funded to date over 900 million in research. We've continued to fund during COVID. We feel like it's incredibly important to give researchers stability for them to know where, where their funding is coming from. And we have kept on funding, even if there were, um, were slight pauses in certain um, in academic institutions when they had to close their doors for a little while in, in the spring. I am encouraged, encouraged um, to be able to tell you that uh, research is continuing and funding is continuing and this work is happening and um, great things are happening for Parkinson's disease. And the model that we're using has become a model for many other disease organizations. So. I know we don't do it alone. This is only possible because all of the people that are involved, which includes the Parkinson's community and includes all of you. So thank you so much for being a part of um, this, this success that we're seeing. Thank you. And uh, it's a wonderful organization. So uh, keep it in mind for yourself and clients. Let's let's jump into our program. Hey, Marty, sure. Marty, can I say something? Sure. Uh, this is a free webinar but i'm going to make at least a 50 dollar donation to the michael j fox foundation and maybe everybody who's listening to this free webinar if they think it was worthwhile might considering joining me and i know you will as well marty sending 50 dollars to the michael j fox if you send 50 i have to send 100 jonathan <laughs> so well, thank every, you guys so much <laughs> We have um, 1,200 people registered for the program, and if all of you sent in 50 bucks, it would, which is nominal and uh, less than half the cost that people that charge for webinars charge, uh, it would be a $60,000 uh, donation to the Fox Foundation to help with the research. And I know that the the webinars are viewed probably an equal number of times on the various websites that we post them on. So if everybody that watches this donates 50 bucks to the Michael J. Fox Foundation, it'll be $120,000, which will certainly help fund some wonderful research. So um, please, please give some thought to that. So let's talk about GRATS, folks, Grant to Retained Annuity Trust. The, the, the big plug in the media on GRATS um, is, gee, it's low interest rates, so wow, GRATS are hot. And there's no question that GRATS work in a, a, a low interest rate environment because that bar, that threshold that you have to exceed and the excess over that threshold um, um, reverts to the remainder people. Is that the right word? I have to say the- Remainder beneficiaries is fine, Marty. There you go. I, was, I didn't want to say remainder man. Uh, remainder beneficiaries um, is greater because the, the, the bar you have to exceed is so much lower. And there's no question that in a low interest rate environment, GRATs are great, but there's a lot more to the discussion. And the lot more kind of falls into a couple of, of categories that we're gonna talk about. First, in 2020, I don't think, and Jonathan may disagree or have a slightly different view, but I don't think that the traditional application of GRATs is two year rolling cascading GRATs, and we'll talk about and explain all that, uh, is, is really necessarily the, the best use of GRATS um, uh, in this environment, and we'll explain why. Um, I think one of the most important things, and we're gonna repeat it again in a few minutes, but I, I just think it's a very important point, and I saw the same issue arise in 2012. In 2012, as you all may recall, uh, the exemption amount was 5 million, 20,000 inflation adjusted, and there was a thought that by 2013, it would drop to a mere 1 million. So people were running like crazy, just like they are in 2020 before perceived possible changes um, in the exemption amount to use exemption. If clients have not first used their exemption, I'm not sure that you want to do a GRAT for them. And Jonathan, I don't know if you have any different views on that as to when a GRAT might make sense if they haven't used exemption. I actually was thinking about that um, uh, <laughs> this afternoon. Um, and I, I do have one thought on that. Um, I have a client that just, even though they have adequate resources to use both uh, spouses' exemptions, we're only going to use one. And frankly, they're they're a little squeamish using more than eight million of exemption, even though the estate 
uh, seems to be able to support using both. So I had actually emailed them suggesting, hey, if all you feel comfortable doing in terms of making transfers, even though it's it's to slats or daps or spats or something where you get access, if you can't get comfortable doing more than 10 million, maybe we use some grats, some um, security grats for some of your remaining uh, assets because you're not giving away the principal. After all, with a grat, you get back the principal and uh, let's call it a CD rate of return, but right now that CD rate of return is pretty low, but you still get back your principal in a rate of return, so you're only giving the upside over that away, and maybe the clients will do more. But but for that, I don't think grats really make sense until you've used exemption, because that seems to be a much more valuable planning idea. And the other thing that we're going to highlight, which is not just useful for 2020 planning, but is useful for grab planning as long as we have grads, and we don't know if that'll be after 2020, is some of the very creative um, 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 drafting provisions that interactive legal contains. And I'm guessing that many or most, if not all of those, were Jonathan's brainchild, so he will enlighten us. But there's some very clever drafting concepts to deal with some of the common grad issues that I, we're going to try to point out. And um, uh, if you're an interactive subscriber, uh, you probably will be happy to know that those are going to be in your grants. If you're not an interactive subscriber, well, that may entice you to subscribe. And I don't get a commission, so I can say that. Teresa can't. So let's, let's Jonathan, do you want to give a little introduction to grants? But I don't think we want to dwell on it too long because we have so many other, other things. But we should set the stage for those that are not as familiar with grants as you. Well, let me just uh, give a minute of it. Uh, Back in the uh, early 80s, the IRS said it was going to change the interest rate, which is used to measure things in trusts and remainders and uh, private annuities from a fixed 6% because interest rates, although they seem exceptionally low right now, and I'm going to tell everyone on this call a secret, and I don't want you to tell anyone, not even your best friend, not even your spouse someday interest rates are going to rise now back in the back in the early 80s they knew they were never going to go down so the irs decided that instead of using a fixed six percent it was going to use a fixed ten percent and uh, i wrote an article with dan hastings about that pointing out what the effects of that would be on the value of an income interest because it made an income interest in a trust much more valuable and the remainder less one of Dan's partners, Dick Kobe, perhaps the best known estate planner of his generation, wrote an idea called a GRIT, a grant or retained income trust. And Dick said, what you do is you create a trust and retain the right to the income for a period of years, which to be successful would have to end before your death. Then your interest would end and what was left in the trust would go to the successor beneficiary, the remainder beneficiaries. And that was a, a great idea because since the value of income was very high, it meant that the value of the remainder was very low. One of the problems is if you died, it was going to be back in your estate. The IRS didn't like that. And so on October 9, 1990, the Congress, at the urging of the Treasury, adopted Section 2702. 2702 says if you make a transfer in trust or a trust equivalent like a joint person a purchase with a family member then we're going to value your retained income interest at zero in fact subject to certain exceptions which doesn't apply here it meant anything you retained in that trust or trust equivalent would be worth zero so you'd be deemed to have made a gift the entire value of the property put in trust one only real exception that they have in there is for a personal residence and that's how so-called qualified personal residence trusts or cuprits came about but those don't work very well today because the value of that retained interest for a period of years is very very low because that's measured by how much income would be generated now that income is very low so the value of the remainder which is what you're giving away is very high but they also said that they would allow you to value a retained annuity stream or a unitrust stream using normal actuarial principles. And where you retain an annuity, the grantor retains an annuity that became known as a grantor retained annuity trust. By the way, you might think about, well, how about why don't we use grantor retained unitrust or grunts, grunts instead of grats? Well, when you think about it, 
when you do a grad, all of the growth above the interest rates, which the IRS uses to measure things in these kind of trusts, the so-called Section 7520 rate, which Marty hasn't told you, but I will let you know, is only 0.4%, less than one half of 1%. All that excess above that 0.4% goes to the benefit of the successor beneficiaries. If you do a grut, you're not going to have that happen because as the grut increases in value, the grantor retains a percentage in that, in that as well. So you're not going to get as much out. And if you can't earn at least that section 7520 rate, you shouldn't be in the game anyway. But that's why you use grats rather than gruts. And they have become a darling of the estate planning bar. And as we're going to discuss, it's really a heads I win, tails I can't lose arrangement for estate tax planning. So let's let's just talk for a minute about the traditional application of the GRAT technique, because we'll then contrast that as we go through the discussion of what you may want to do different uh, in the end of 2020. And I, I think that in many cases, you will want to do a lot different, not in all cases, but maybe even in most. So the common application of the GRAT technique was to create what were called short-term rolling GRAT, short-term two-year GRATs. Uh, I know Jonathan could wax and wane on, on, on the term, but we're, we're going to kind of move forward. Um, the, the thought is that two years seemed to be the lowest, shortest term that we could do a GRAT for. And one of the rationales for doing short-term GRATs is, as we've discussed, a GRAT mechanism, its success is slicing off the upside volatility above that 75-20 rate, which is very, very low in the current environment. But if you did a 10-year GRAT, for example, you have certainly the potential for more growth, but you, 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 your, your, your risk of a down value, of a reduction in value becomes greater. The more years you have, let's say it's a marketable security, uh, stocks go up and down, maybe except for Apple, but stocks go up and down. And if you hold a stock for 10 years and it goes down, you've lost the gain. So the idea was you do a short-term grat, uh, two years being, let's say, the shortest, and you get a grad payment back. So if you did a, a million dollar grad, you'd get $500,000 back roughly after one year, but we'll talk about the 105 day uh, rule plus interest on that. And then you would take that 500,000 plus interest payment, the annuity payment, and you would regrad it into a new grad and start another two year period. And then for the first grad after the next year, and we'll come to the 105 days in a minute, you'd make a final payment, which would be 500,000 plus the interest uh, component under under the, the, the calculation, and that would come back and then you'd regret that. So the idea is that that you have a short-term period and you're constantly taking out, regretting, take out, regret, and by doing that, you're slicing off the upside volatility. So if, if you had a uh, Zoom stock and it bounced tremendously, and you know you got half of it back uh, it, it, after the first year. You've sliced off the upside. You've locked in the benefit because the excess over the half a million is now outside the estate. And we'll talk about grad immunization in a few minutes because that's another means of locking it in. So the way grads would develop is you would do a um, two-year grad, and each year you got a payment. You'd regrad it, so you'd have these constant rolling, or some call them cascading grads. So it would become a tier of rolling or cascading grat, two-year grats, on and on. The, the other piece that does remain uh, uh, very important in a grat is the more granular that you get a grat because of the, the, the phrase Jonathan said, heads, heads you win, tails you don't lose, is the more granular a grat, the more productive it could be because downside risk has no loss to you unless it's offsetting the upside. So if you put a diversified portfolio into a GRAT, which I've seen happen way too often, you're really defeating the point of the GRAT. If instead you did 10 GRATs with a security in each GRAT, if you have six that have not really gone up much or even dropped, but four that were gangbusters, those four gangbusters would be, uh, all that growth would be out of your estate. And the ones that didn't work, so what? You re them and you try again. But too often people would mix GRATs 
or have a more diversified portfolio so you offset some of the bang for your buck with the GRAT mechanism. So the Marty, tradition, sure. Marty, let me mention that right after section 2702 came into effect, uh, I looked at my portfolio. I own 10 different stocks like Microsoft and AT&T. And I said, well, suppose two years ago, I had put those into a GRAT, took basically a very, very modest amount of remainder value. So the gift was very small and we can talk about that more in a little while. What would have happened? Well, guess what? It would have failed because the stocks did not appreciate at the same rate, the section 7520 rate, which in those days was relatively high. It was about 8%. And the stocks on average didn't grow by more than 8% a year. So everything came back to me, it failed. But then I said, well, suppose I had put one of the 10 stocks in a different grad. And it turned out that three of the 10 did well. So we were able to transfer value or would have been able to transfer value out of my estate entirely free of gift tax by reason of doing separate grads. Now, let me mention, if you're going to use separate grads, and I know some people disagree, some people say, well, I'm going to do one trust and I'm just going to have 10 identical trusts under that one GRAT form. When I've done this for clients, I use 10 different documents. I have every GRAT started on a different date. I have the value of the remainder different. And I have them last for a different period of time, maybe two years, two years in a week, two years in two weeks. And I also have different remainder beneficiaries. I don't just have it to my descendants per stirpes. I have some of the kids in and some of the kids out. And if someone winds up with a lot more than siblings receive, you can always amend that with respect to other documents. You do not want to be the low hanging fruit. If you're going to do multiple grats, these granular grats, as Marty's called them, please go the extra mile and have your client do actually separate trusts with different assets, with different terms, with different values of the remainder, with somewhat different uh, beneficiaries. I think it's gonna be much harder for the IRS to make a challenge. And if it's gonna make one because it doesn't like granular grats, it's not gonna come after you. Remember the IRS, I hate to say this in public, the IRS is only in it for the money and it wants the easiest money possible. It doesn't want to have to high, really fight hard for it. So make yourself as high up in the tree as you possibly can. Now, let me also mention, Marty has cited to an article that Diana Zadel and I did a number of years ago for the Heckerling Institute about comparing grats and installment sales. And one of the things we point out is we really don't know for certain what is the minimum value of the remainder you need to have a good grat. So Diana and I can, and we also don't know how long it has to last. Can it last two years? Can it last 366 days? Does it have to be at least five years? We just don't know. So Diana and I came up with word formulas, which basically say like, if you want the value of the remainder to say be 1% or one tenth of 1%, you'll say that the annuity has to be of such size and of such duration that the value of the remainder will be the greater of 1% or 0.1%, whatever you want, or the minimum value to have a qualified interest within the meaning of 25.2702-3. That way you have a formula which will adjust. So if the IRS comes in, I don't think it will, but if it comes in and it says it's gotta be 10%, it's gotta be 20, the Duration has to be at least five years, which is, by the way, taken that position in audits, although it's never taken anyone to court. You will be protected. And again, you will not be the low hanging fruit. And we'll Teresa, talk more about that, Marty, when we talk about the 105 day rule. Teresa, do we have that sample language in, in the materials or no? The formula? We don't hear you. Your volume's off. We do have the, the, we show the option on the screen for the safe harbor formula that we call it. Um, I don't think we added the language in here. We did add the language for the 105 day rule and okay. some of the other protective measures. Okay. Um, so one but, of the but, questions. But, but let, me, let me mention, I mean, you, you don't have to subscribe to ILS to do this. Get it from a friend or something, but there's no downside in putting that in. Now you may say, I don't need it. I'm absolutely confident. 
Well, if your client is attacked, how are you going to justify that you wouldn't spend the extra 10 minutes in putting in this safe harbor language? I just don't think you can justify it. It's there. It won't cost you anything because you can borrow it from someone else. Please do that. The same thing with the duration. This trust will last for the longer of two years or whatever is the minimum period of time in order to have a qualified interest for a grant or retained annuity trust within the meaning of 25.2702-3. And if you play this slow enough, you can just copy that right down. That'll work. <laughs> so one of the questions that's really critical for late 2020 planning is, is this the type of grant that you want to do now? Now, yes, the more granular, the better. And if you can't do individual stocks, maybe you do different asset classes, right? You know, micro, uh, micro cap uh, US stocks in one, uh, you know, foreign debt in another and so on and so forth. But, but this also points that if you're using marketable securities, this is not merely a legal exercise. It's critical to have the wealth advisor, investment advisor uh, uh, fully engaged in, in the planning because it may not change the overall asset allocation for the client, but it very will change, much will change the decisions on asset location, meaning which buckets you put which asset classes in. So clearly coordinating with the wealth advisor is essential and, and, and that's, that's key to making it work. But what's different in 2020? If rolling or cascading grats, um, wh why would we not use them now? Uh, because one of the we, we don't know what's going to happen with the election and we're not predicting and by the way I'm going to make a disclaimer for Jonathan Teresa and I we're not being political with anything we say we're just trying to help you as tax advisors so uh, if it sounds political it's not it's just tax comments but many people think and this seems to be the default for 20 late 2020 planning if there's a democratic sweep and nobody knows if there's a democratic sweep they will change the tax laws I think that's a pretty safe bet, and they will make taxes much harsher, especially on the wealthy. I think that's a pretty safe bet if there's a democratic sweep, which I'm not predicting either way. But what will they change? Now, Biden has not really given at the stage that we're talking today um, great detail about his proposals. There's been talk about eliminating basis step up, uh, which we hear that Jonathan's behind so he can sell his book again. Um, we um, uh, have heard about the possibility of the capital gains on death and so on and so forth. But what a lot of people suspect, and this has become the default for planning, is that something along the lines of what President Obama had in his Green Book year after year and what Bernie Sanders and, and Congressman Gomez proposed in the Senate and House respectively will be the template. And those proposals include things like a minimum 10-year term for a grad. Those things include a minimum gift for a grad of, I think, 25% of the value of the assets going in the grad or 500,000 or something to that effect. But the bottom line is, if you have a minimum 10-year term for a grad, uh, a lot of clients will just never do a grad. And if you have to have a large minimum gift, it kind of defeats the whole point of a grad because now it's no longer, a, as Jonathan said, a heads you win, tails you don't lose uh, arrangement. So grads as we know them may not exist after this year. And there's another unknown, when will the, any of these changes, if they happen, uh, be effective? And there's some speculation, gee, what if they make a retroactively effective to January 1, 2021? We don't know that either. So you got layer upon layer upon layer of, of, of uncertainty. But the bottom line is, we don't know if we'll have GRATs in the form we know them starting next year, sometime next year. So if that's the case, does it make sense to do a two-year GRAT? Again, considering the comments Jonathan made about the uncertainty of what the minimum term was? And the answer is maybe not, because the, the whole um, uh, assumption or, or basis on which you did two-year grats is that you could roll or cascade them. When I get out my first payment, I regret it. When I get out my next payment on the two-year grat, I regret it, then I regret it, and I regret it. And you keep going on and on and on with these rolling or cascading grats. If grats as we know them end next year, does it make sense to use a two-year grat? The answer is it always is in our profession is it depends. But I think we need to, for the first time perhaps, think about doing something other than two-year grads. More specifically, what if instead of doing a two-year grad, we do a, 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 a four, six, eight, and 10-year grad, a ladder of grads. And why would I suggest a ladder of grads? If you can't regrat the annuity payments as you get them because grads won't work because of this minimum gift requirement and 10-year term requirement, maybe you do a ladder of grads now to lock in not just the low interest rate, but also to lock in the favorable grat rules that may not continue. 
So I think one of the things that we can talk to clients about is not just a two-year rolling grad strategy as we typically traditionally have done, but modifying that to do a ladder of grads to address the risk of grads disappearing. Jonathan, do you want to comment about um, a, a zeroed out grad any further? I think you, you've kind of talked about it. Well, I mean, a lot of lawyers uh, think you can do a zeroed out grad. You have the annuity of such a size that you are going to have the value of the remainder be zero. And uh, there are a couple of issues about that. One is if you make it some percentage, like 1% or a half a percent, if the IRS can come in and show that the value of what you put in is wrong, there'll be an automatic adjustment. In fact, the stamp of forms that like we have at ILS and others you'll see have an automatic provision that if the value has been incorrectly determined, then you will change what has been paid and either take money back from the grantor or give more to the grantor, all in accordance with what we have for charitable remainder trust with a sample language that the Internal Revenue Service has approved. If you make the value of the remainder exactly zero, the IRS can't do anything. And the IRS, I think, in such a case might scream proctor. Proctor is an old Fourth Circuit case where someone tried to avoid paying any gift tax by saying, hey, by the way, if these gifts I'm making don't qualify for the gift tax annual exclusion, then I'm not making them and it would come back to me. The court said you can't do that. You're basically frustrating the tax system in an unsound way. And I think that's a possibility. So my recommendation is you can leave it to be a tiny amount, make it a percentage, make it one one hundredth of 1%, one percent, one one thousandth of 1%, because if the IRS can come in and show that the valuation was incorrect, it can make you pay more and you'll have to pay a larger gift because that one tenth of 1%, if the value of the assets goes up, means that the taxable gift was greater. And the only way, of course, to get that result is going to be um, if the grantor dies before the grant term ends, the annuity payments have to be made to the grantor's estate. And that way we get to value that reversion as well and we can get as close to zero as you want to, to do. I think on the next slide we have an image just the way we approach it from an interactive legal standpoint where at the top we're saying it's payable to the grantor and estate, which is going to give you that you know, as large as possible retained interest so the gift you're making is small. Now the example here does say the taxable remainder percent, we're going to use a word formula to say it's going to be zero, truly zeroing it out. And I've worked with lawyers who want to draft it that way, but you'll see another example coming up where instead of zero, we've got, you know, 0.1% or it could be 1%. And then the safe harbor language is going to substitute whatever it needs to be in case the law does change and it's retroactive and your grant gets caught by that retroactive change. Just a little sidebar, when you when you use this approach, uh, if the client dies during the grant term, and we're going to talk about what's actually included in the estate because it's different than what many anticipate and gives us some creative planning uh, strategies with very long-term grants we're going to talk about. But pay attention when you're administering this to where it goes in the estate and what has to get paid and having that annuity payment paid properly. One of the things that we did once is we had some concerns about some planning where uh, failed grants paid into uh, Q-tip trusts in the estate and we were doing some planning where we drew assets out of the Q-tip to engage in planning and had some concern about a 2519 issue being raised by the service. So we tried to build a wall, build a wall between the failed grants and other types of Q-tip trusts that were under the estate uh, by intentionally not merging um, the trust at any point in time to have one big Q-tip but to maintain them separately sort of to contain uh, the parameters of a 2519 challenge. So there's lots of interesting administrative ramifications uh, with that down the road, but that's kind of beyond what we're going to do. Um, Jonathan, you want to comment at all about grad payments uh, and how to structure those? Well, you can use a fixed dollar amount and, and that will be the amount of the annuity. Of course, if you make a mistake in valuation or if you've used a, a system that doesn't give you the right number, it may be a larger gift than you think. You can make it a specified percentage of the original value, like pay 50.1% each year for two years. That's another approach you can do. 
Uh, I prefer, as we have highlighted there, a word formula to determine the value of the remainder. So again, you will in substance say, pay this remainder for the term of this grat, which again, you will have also as a formula, so that the actuarial value of the remainder is going to be 0.1% or 1%. Now, it shows also you can have an increasing percentage annuity. When I first started looking at grats, I thought, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase the grat tremendously because that way we leave more in the grat and we have more to earn more than the Section 7520 rate. So we'll have more in the trust when it ends and more will pass to the successor remainder beneficiaries. Uh, I thought that was the cat's meow. And I wrote an article about it, which apparently the IRS read. And so it put something in the regulation saying, we will give you no credit for any annuity payment that increases at more than 20% a year. Now you get into questions, well, what does 20% a year mean? Does it mean as though it had been around for a whole year? Because you may not start your grat on January 1 of every year. Uh, I came to realize later that I was wrong. Rather than having the annuity payments increase, you want them to radically decrease. And the regulations under section 2702 make it abundantly clear that although they won't give you credit, if you go above a 20% annual increase, there's no limit on the downside. So you put a million dollars into a grad, and let's hypothetically assume that we can only use two years. And again, you'll use formulas to make sure you don't violate that. But you'll say, pay me, the grantor, $990,000 in the first year, and then pay me like $12,000 or $15,000 in the second year. Why am I doing that? Because if we have great performance that first year, my million dollars grows to a million four, I'm basically, I'm going to get back 990,000 the first year, leaving 410,000. I'm only going to have to pay 15,000 in a successor year. It's guaranteed to be a winner. If I use one where the payments are level or where they actually go up, it may get wiped out. Maybe the first year it goes up 40%, but the next year it goes down 50%. Well, guess what? If you basically have steady grat payments or grat payments worse that increase, it's gonna be a loser. But if you start with an exceptionally high annuity payment, then you're, and it goes up a lot, you're gonna be short of passing property out. On the other hand, let's assume it, it crashes. You put in a million, it drops to 800,000, it's gotta pay you $980,000. It can't pay you $990,000. It can only pay you the 800,000 that's there. Your grad has failed. But as Marty said, what you would normally do is you would regrad it. You take that 800,000 out. We now know it's failed. We're not going to administer it anymore. And we're going to regrad that $800,000 annuity payment and try it again. With on that 800,000, maybe we say, pay me 790,000 the first year and 12 or 15,000, whatever we need to, to bring it down to the minimum value we think is safe again, subject to a word formula, the second year. So if the second year, it goes from 800,000 to 700,000, again, it's a loser. My grat will have failed, I'll have gotten the 700,000 back and I can regrat it. Well, as Marty was indicating, if you do this enough, it's probable that eventually you will come to a year when you have fantastic growth. And when you have fantastic growth, you'll take out your annuity and you'll be leaving a lot left in the grat. And so it will be a tremendously successful one as long as we can use rolling grats, as Marty has explained them. Grat and also, Go on, Teresa. I was just going to say, in all those years that the grat didn't work, you're no worse off than if you hadn't done it to start with. That's correct. So it's a true heads I win, tails I can't lose situation, except you're going to be making very, very modest gifts, or at least we think you can make modest gifts, um, which, by the way, cannot be protected by the annual exclusion. The remainder is a gift of a future interest, and you can't use the annual exclusion with respect to gifts of a future interest, but it should be pretty small. So, On the next screen, we have some images also um, from the program where you get to make these selections. And I will say, Jonathan, that you talked about the declining annuity payments. That's the one I didn't put in the presentation. You know, it's nice to be able to adjust what you're doing and the type of formula you want to use and the percentage you want to use, even the number of years, 
without having to redraft your form. And you can see on the left, we talk about paying on the anniversary date of the grant uh, or of the, when the grant becomes irrevocable, which I think we're going to talk about in a minute. And on the right, we did it on a calendar year basis. On the left, we did a fixed payment formula. And on the right, we did that 20% increasing. But we also could have done the declining. And so it gives you the option to you know, have those provisions at your fingertips. That, that, by the way, illustrates the power of drafting software. Click, click, and you make the decision to move on. And it's interesting, uh, when, when I, I see some colleagues who use drafting software, they will give a, a little memo uh, to a administrative staff person and say, go draft this document, and they have the administrative person doing that. I think it's the wrong way to do it. If you look at the power of the software, this is really something that a fairly senior lawyer should be doing because every one of those little boxes has intriguing implications to the overall plan. And, you know, I'll play devil's advocate and I hate to even say I'm going to risk disagreeing with Jonathan. I wouldn't go that far. It's, it, that would be dangerous. Um, but just offer perhaps a, a suggested uh, alternative. So you don't need to have the front-loaded payments because you can use immunization to lock in the gain. And we're going to talk about that in a later slide, especially in the context of 20. Uh, 20 planning. The other thing is, if you're using GRATS not for marketable securities, which is where a lot of the literature is based on it, the assumption that you're using uh, uh, marketable securities in the GRAT, but if you're using it for a family business interest, um, you may want to backload it just so that you can structure it so the cash flow uh, that will be available in the business uh, may be able to be sufficient uh, to make cash payments and not have leakage back. And that's especially important with a non-marketable asset like an interest in rental real estate LLCs or family business holdings, because then you'd have to appraise those non-marketable assets and use those to pay back, which gets costly and complicated. Um, so you, you know that may be an application that's different than the marketable security construct that most brats are thought of in. So in those cases, a backloaded may make some sense. Um, I, I think we've talked about a lot of the grab payments. Um, I would think you'd want to probably structure it to be on the anniversary date because if you do a two-year grad, for example, and you have it a calendar year, you now have three grad payments, especially if you have a non-marketable asset, it's more complex. But even with marketable securities, you now have three payments instead of two, so it might be easier. Um, Marty, no, Marty, let me say something about that. Uh, early on, we had a client who wanted to do a very, very large grad. And... Uh, I became concerned because we were creating the GRAT in the middle of the year as to how we would determine the payments and how we would determine the increase of 20%. So uh, we decided that if we were gonna make these payments on a calendar year basis, which is what the regs required, how would it work, You know, what would be the calculation? And indeed, I hired an actuary I had known for a year, a fellow named Ed Heinsberger from Portland, Oregon, who's just great. Uh, I went to college with his sister, and she also was a math major. And I asked Ed, and he said, Jonathan, I'm not sure. And I said, well, Ed, got good news for you. The IRS says if you can't figure out what the value of things are and things like a GRAT by using what it has published, you can go to them, and their actuaries will do the calculation for you. And Ed said, great, I'm going to call when he called and explained the problem, they just said, we can't take this on, where people are all creating these grats other than on January 1 of the first year. So they went to the lawyers in the IRS and said, you got to change the regs. And that's why you're now given the option to have the first payment date on the anniversary of the grats start date. And I'm going to tell you that will be a lot easier for you to figure it out. You can use standard software like Tiger Tables or Number Cruncher to figure it out rather than having to hire an actuary to do it for you. Thank you, Ed. So let's let's go on. Um, when should grab payments be made? So if I do a grad on June 1st, uh, do I make the payment uh, the last day of May, June 1st of the following year? Oh, no answer. So you, the, well, the, well, the answer, Marty, it depends on what you put in. If you say that the you're going to make the payments, they got to be adjusted for short years. 
that it's going to be an anniversary, which is the standard stuff that you see in many, many forms. You can get that in our forms as well. You go ahead and say it's got to be paid on December 31st. Or you can say it will be on the anniversary date, which would be June 1. Now, they do give you, Marty, of course, a grace period. It says that you don't have to make that payment actually on December 31st. If you're using a calendar year, you can make it 105 days later, which sounds fantastic. But what happens, Marty, if we don't make it on time? Well, I got a call many, many years ago from a lawyer who said, we did this grad, it has worked out perfectly, except the IRS came in and it asked us for proof that the annuity payments had been made on time. And by, by the way, by the way, every grad audit I've seen, they ask, show me proof that you made your annuity payments on time. So you right. may as well, what I recommend to clients is when we set up grads, is that they save in their files, because I don't like to monitor this, um, uh, proof of payment for any grants they do, as well as no payments, similar issue. So when the IRS comes in and asks the obvious, because as Jonathan said, why shouldn't they pick the low hanging fruit? You have the stuff ready to show them here, all the grab payments, all the note payments on our note sales, everything was done on time and administered properly. The, the problem is that I got this call, they had done a grad, gone in, it had been $2 million. And I'm sorry, it was $10 million and it had doubled in value in four years when the grant was about to end. The IRS came in and audited and it show us these payments of about, you know, two and a half million dollars each and every year because it was 10 million that went in. They had never made a payment. And the IRS took the position based upon an extremely interesting case out of the 11th Circuit, the Florida area called Atkinson. Mr. Atkinson had created a charitable remainder annuity trust, and the IRS said it was a failed annuity trust from inception because they had not paid any of the annuity payments. So there's a long background to this, but the 11th Circuit agreed because they had not made the annuity payments on time, it was failed from inception. So the IRS was taking the position in this case because they had not paid the annuity to the grantor on time, it was failed from inception, and the entire $10 million was a gift. It was devastating. Now, I did some, well, some might call uh, clever things to convince the IRS that because the grantor was the trustee and because payments had been in, that they were deemed paid to him, and they conceded 90% of the matter to me. Well, what I did, Marty, uh, maybe you've done this, I started calling my clients who had created grats and had their brother, their sister, their niece, their nephew, their daughter, their son as the trustee. I called eight of them. And do you know how many of those lay people had made the annuity payments on time? It's a round number, Marty. It's a hint. Ten? It was, it was exactly I think it's zero. Well, out of eight, it would be tough to say it was ten. It was exactly zero. Now, one of the guys who I thought was a friend of mine, he was the trustee for his mother's grad, said, well, Jonathan, if the IRS comes in and sues on this, I'm going to sue you. I said, well, where are you going to sue me? He said, you knew I was incompetent to be a trustee, <laughs> even though this guy had an MBA. Fortunately, there was never an audit. But what I did is it worried me enough. And Teresa, maybe you'll go back and show that option. We have anti-Atkinson language, and it basically says the following. You can draft it yourself, but I think it really works. You say, if the annuity that's due has not been paid in full on that grace period date, then the assets will automatically be deemed owned to that extent by the grantor. There doesn't have to be any transfer, but the grantor is going to be deemed to own, let's say the annuity should be 500,000, 500,000 of the assets. And I specify which assets that will be. That way, if you're in a situation where the trustee does not make the payment on time because you have an absolute vesting of the amount of the annuity equal to the uh, their tra assets that are still held by the trustee, I think you'll have it. I even go so far to say that that ownership will occur even if there is no transfer and that the trustee will be deemed to be the agent for the grantor for purposes of holding it and that you know commingling of the assets is permitted. So again, you're trying to prevent yourself from being the low-hanging fruit. 
IRS comes in and I know none of you has a client who would fail to make the payments on time. But if you were like me and all the ones I checked, all eight I checked had failed to make the, and not only failed to make a payment on time, they'd failed to make the payments at all. And in fact, in my engagement letter for a grad, I would, when I transfer a copy of the grad to the client saying, we are not going to monitor or be responsible if the annuity is not paid on time, unless you separately engage us to do that. And uh, by the way, I never had to take her on that. But uh, Marty, your, your experience is probably different because I know you only choose clients who do absolutely the perfect thing every time. I actually have a better answer. First of all, I use interactive that has that default language but I don't like to be the low hanging fruit. I'm not sure if you've heard of that concept before. So what I recommend to my clients is that um, you use an institutional administrative trustee. And if you're paying five grand a year on a large complex transaction, and you're paying a mere five grand a year, but know that the grad payments are gonna be made on time by an institutional trustee, that becomes a very inexpensive insurance policy. And I'm thinking not just for grats where you're putting a couple million dollars in grats, but if you have grats as a, a spillover for a defined value mechanism in a multi hundred million dollar note sale transaction, you really don't want that grat administered properly because you may thereby destroy the, the spillover mechanism. And Jonathan and I may be doing a uh, follow up webinar on note sales at the end of 2020, and we'll go to that in more depth. But let me go back to the 105 uh, day rule on, 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 on slide 17. I've seen a lot of people that have administered grats not understanding the basic concepts that Jonathan has talked about of wanting to get as much growth inside the grat because hey, that's how you make it work and you make it sing. So, you know, they'll make the grat payment on, on, on the anniversary date thinking that's when they need to do it. But if the regs give you this grace period, um, of 105 days, I've kind of gotten chicken. I don't like to go 105 days. What if I counted wrong? So maybe 100 days. But the point is, if you leave the money in for another 100 days, even if it's just compounding, uh, I guess the current interest rates don't matter, but in a normal world, even that interest is helpful. But if there's market growth over that 100 days, that's that that really can boost the return and in the, in the, in the success of the GRAT. So you should certainly look at that in the administration of the GRAT. So let, let's go on. Um, we've covered that. This is, Teresa, do you want to mention on Jonathan kind of beat you to the punch, <laughs> but let's talk about it anyhow. That's all right. A couple of slides back, we did have our example of the 105 day provision, just so we have given that, which is nice. The other thing that this mentions, and it's italicized there, is that um, you might have a situation where you want to make the grant revocable until the grantor gives notice that it's now going to be irrevocable. Maybe you're going to be funding it over time and you want to start the clock ticking on that final funding. And so that's why that parenthetical is there. But that's the 105 day provision. And then going forward, what Marty had on the screen is that anti Atkinson language. And I've got it in a box there. And then there's the commentary about it that refers exactly to the case Jonathan was talking about. And then on the next page, it should be at least an excerpt from that language that says, if the payment's not actually made, it still has vested in the grantor. Or if the grantor's passed away, we're talking still about the grantor's estate. And so this is that provision that he was referring to, anti-Atkinson. So one of the things that uh, Teresa just mentioned that, that's interesting is having the GRAT revocable until the final funding is made, because as you all should know, you can only make contributions to a GRAT once. One of the things that I've used when we've had closings for GRATs, and I, I like the idea of a formal closing, we've always done them large to some degree virtually, and now it'll probably be fully virtual. Uh, if I have an institutional trustee, say in Alaska or Nevada or South Dakota, wherever, and uh, we're gonna send a, a check and stock certificate or something up to them to hold, I have a little side agreement that I do where they appoint me as the agent. So when I receive the actual stock certificate and check, it's as if they received it and the funding is effective the date the grant was signed and it's all effective the same day. Um, let's, let's go on. We've talked about that. Uh, slide 22 lists some other grant requirements. Let's skip through those. 
Slide 23 talks about the granular GRATs. We've already discussed that. And uh, regardless what happens, if GRATs are still around, the more granular you can make them, the better. Obviously, if it's a family business, it doesn't necessarily work, but maybe it does because you may have a separate real estate entity owning real estate, a separate operating company. You want separate GRATs if you're transferring those interests. But certainly in the context of marketable securities, uh, I, the ideal is separate stocks in each. If you can't do that, separate asset classes. Um, let's talk about GRAT immunization. Um, so the concept is the following. Jonathan mentioned why he likes to front load instead of back load payments. And I gave you uh, a situation where, you you know, the, with a closely held business, you may want to back load. But the point was you want to get the assets out of the GRAT that have highly appreciated. If you bought Zoom stock or Apple stock in a GRAT, how long do you want to keep riding it? You know, why not pull it out? and put cash into the GRAT so that if the, the stock drops in value, look at what happened with uh, Tesla at uh, some point in, in 2020. The huge rise, then, then a fall. I don't know where it is today, but the point is when you've gotten a great run up, you can immunize, that's the word I've traditionally heard, typically heard used for it, the GRAT. You pull out your Tesla stock, you put in cash. If Tesla later declines, you got cash in the uh, GRAT, so you've locked in or immunized the gain inside the GRAT. So let's, I, I think it's a great concept and it's certainly something about uh, immunizing. And we're gonna talk about uh, in a few minutes how immunization of a 2020 GRAT may be different. And you know what, I'm gonna just do it now even though the slide's later on the 2020 planning because maybe it'll just make more sense in the context of having just explained immunization. What's different about immunizing the grats we may create at the end of 2020? Well, one of the concepts that I put across is if the rolling cascading grats won't continue because grat rules may change in a, a very restrictive way, so we don't really have the, the ability to use grats like we have, then I suggested instead of doing two-year grats anticipating that you're going to roll them, maybe you do a six, eight, and 10-year grat ladder. And why did I suggest six, eight, and 10 years? Just making up numbers, but the idea is the further out you go, the greater the longevity risk. And that's another issue you have to deal with separately in the context of 2020 GRAP planning. If you want to lock in GRAP benefits and these really low interest rates, you may want a longer term GRAP. Immunization, apropos of this topic on slide 26, will also change. The traditional way you immunized a GRAP was what I just said. You pull out your, your Zoom stock, you put in cash, and it's only a two-year grat, so you sit on the cash till the two years ends, and then you, you pull it out and you re-grat and buy something else and put it into the new grat. But if you have a 10-year grat or a 12-year grat, are you gonna immunize by pulling out your Zoom and putting in cash? I don't think so. No one's gonna sit in year one on in a 12-year grat for another 11 years on cash. So now what really happens is you have to immunize in a more complex way, and it really requires a far greater participation and involvement by, by the wealth advisor or investment advisor for the client. Maybe what you want now is exactly what Jonathan and I told you earlier not to do. You don't want to put a diversified portfolio in a grant because the winners kind of offset the losers, but hopefully you get a little growth because that demeans the grant mechanism of slicing off upside volatility. But now when you immunize, you don't want to sit on cash. Maybe now you want a diversified portfolio. Maybe you want to have hedging uh, strategies. Maybe you want to look at some other creative techniques for how you immunize. So immunization, if you start to create longer term laddered grats, just because of the potential for grats ending after 2020 is a whole new ball game. Uh, it should be very interesting. So Jonathan, you want to talk on slide 28 about the perfect storm? Well, uh, Marty, uh, I, I mean, the perfect storm is right now because you just can't get rates any lower than 0.4%. I mean, I, I posed questions on some listservs about what happens if we go into negative numbers, but whether it's 0.4 or whether it's 1%, the opportunity is just fantastic because the gift you'll make is going to be so tiny because the value of the annuity that you retain is so great. Uh, I just going to tell you, there's probably never been a greater opportunity for the use of grats or charitable lead trusts or similar transactions like a private annuity than we have right now with these exceptionally low Section 7520 rates. 
I mean, you know, when they first came out, as I mentioned before, they went from 6% to uh, 10%. And then because people started beating up on that because it made the value of a, a, a income interest so great, that's when they decided to adopt 2702 and say, you can't do annuities anymore. You're going to have do income interest anymore. You're going to have to use annuities. And that basically said, well, you're not going to get the benefit of permanent high rates using an income interest because you can't do an income interest. And the rates were so high that it made the value of the annuity very low with that 10%. So they adopted that. And they also said, well, what we're going to do is not give you a fixed return pursuant to Section 7520. We're going to give you one that changes every month. And as a consequence, we will publish, and you must use that rate, known as the Section 7520 rate, when you do your grad or you do your private annuity. If you do a charitable lead trust or a remainder trust, they give you a choice. You can use the month you've done it or either of the two prior months. So uh, that's really good. But I don't think they envisioned that interest rates would drop as much as they have and make the value of an annuity so great that it would be very, very easy to minimize the gift you make. Keep in mind also in terms of the perfect storm, uh, many asset values, especially a lot of close held business real estate holdings are, are still severely depressed. You know, the, the, the tech stocks have gone through the roof, but there's lots of, lots of assets that are of very low values. So you have low values, low interest rates. You have what we've talked about multiple times already that the, the, the democratic proposals, if there's a democratic sweep, and they enact a new legislation may eliminate grats. So this may be the last bat bite at the grat apple. So there's a whole bunch of things that make grats great right now. But keep in mind the comments we made. If a client has not used their exemption, in, I think in the vast majority of cases, a grat is not going to be the right tool. And don't misuse it because if you do a bunch of grats and the client comes back and says, well, we didn't use any of my exemption, then you know maybe that's not an optimal plan. Teresa? I was just going to ask you guys an exact question because nobody has a crystal ball, but we hear so much about the perfect storm and using the exemption. Um, and so if you were talking to a client and they were debating, well, should I do a grab or should I use my exemption? I mean, obviously it's going to depend. Every situation depends. But I almost feel like I would always gravitate toward using that exemption before we lose it. Um, Especially because if you do that, you're not getting anything back to the grantor. Everything's uh, moved on to the next generation, free of transfer tax, and you can make it GST exempt, which you can't do with the GRAT because Correct. you've got that estate tax inclusion period. Yeah, you know, one I, other thing. One other thing you might think: Well, gee, my client will do the GRAT because she's going to get payments for a period of years or possibly for her life. But if she just uses her exemption, she won't. Well, that's not true. Marty and I, along with Teresa, have given a lot of articles and we've given a lot of webinars on how you can use DAPs or hybrid DAPs or you can use something we created called a SPAT uh, in order to retain an interest in the property that you've given away using your exemption. So slide 30 goes through some of these points too. You use them wisely and, and in appropriate circumstances. Now, Jonathan, um, I think that we have a uh, technique that you, you created on slide 32 that could be an alternative to a grat that you should explain to everybody. And by the way, we're, we're, we're over time, but I think we do that all the time. So forgive us. I, I told, just keep Marty, going. I, I told you we would. This is something I developed called a split purchase annuity trust. And here's the deal. 2702 says you don't have to use a zero value for what you retain if what you retain in a GRAT or a GRAT equivalent in the form of an annuity. And the regulations under section 25.2702-3 explain what all that means. But what it also means is that if you do a split purchase with a child, for example, you can go ahead and use that same annuity. Basically, it's a special rule. It's not an exception, it's a special rule. It says you can use normal actuarial principles to value the annuity. So here's the way it would work. I have a pool of assets. Let's say, you know, I'm like Marty Shankman, I got $50 million, not a problem. And I go in and I buy a life annuity or an annuity for a term for years, but let's say a life annuity I purchase from that $50 million. 
And in fact, I can, because the value of annuities is so great, because the Section 7520 rate is so low, I can retain the right to that annuity for my life, even though I'm a fairly old man now, and basically leave a very tiny value for the remainder. And then a GST exempt trust, which is a grantor trust with respect to me, or maybe with respect to my wife, can come in and buy the remainder. So I can say pay 48 million for my life annuity. And this GST exempt trust can come in and pay 2 million for the value of the remainder. Now, I'm, the remainder is being purchased by a GST exempt trust. You don't have to worry about the ETIP period that Teresa mentioned. You won't have a state tax inclusion because I didn't give away the remainder. It was purchased by a separate trust. And that means that I have an annuity stream for life, and most people love it when they have annuities for life. But if I die early, this is a huge windfall. And remember, it's assumed that these assets, this pool of 50 million, for the rest of time is only going to grow at 0.4% a year. So if you have good investment performance, you're going to win. And also, we know you really can't use a grant for someone with a diminished life expectancy. But if your client has at least a 50% medical probability of living for at least one year, then you can use normal actuarial principles. So if you have a client, say, who's 70 years old and she has heart disease or he has cancer, and you know they're not going to live a normal life expectancy, but you can get the doctors to certify there's at least a 50% chance of survival for a year. Take a look at the regs under... 25.7520-3, 25.7520-3, you can use normal actuarial principles, which means the annuity I purchase will be deemed to be paid for my normal life expectancy. You can crush down the value of the remainder, have that GSD exempt trust buy it, no estate tax inclusion at all. We'll talk more about what that would be if you did a graph, but here, because it's a split purchase, you can do it. Now, this is a complicated matter, but if you get the BNA tax management portfolio, now the Bloomberg tax management portfolio, by my former partner, Georgiana Slade, and my dear friend, Diana Zadel, and me, you'll read all about it. That split purchase annuity trust, or a splat, as I call it, is a super cool idea. But as far as I'm aware, Diana and I are the only two in the entire universe who have ever used it, even though... I think it is the cat's meow. Hey, Jonathan, what do your grandchildren say to you when you use phrases like super cool? <laughs> Don't answer the question. So let's talk very quickly about failed grats. One of the things that may have happened from the current environment, if you had shopping centers in the grats, it's possible the values are down and the grat may fail. Um, you know, you pay out your annuity payment if you have to use principal in kind because the cash flow is not there because of rent uh, concessions or something. You just regrat them in the current environment, but consider the discussions that we've had. Uh, and and as uh, slide 38, I mean, volatility is why you did a grat, and doesn't volatility doesn't always go the way you want. So that's just a fact of grat life. Um, and there's some more details on failed grats, but we're we're going to consider those. So so. The, the, the slide 43, we, we talk about, we've kind of already covered it, what the Democrats may do with, with grats if they have new tax legislation. Again, we have no idea who's going to win the election. We don't know when we're going to know who wins the election. And even if the Democrats win, will they get the Senate and the House and the White House so that they can push through major tax legislation? If all that happens, and those are a number of ifs, um, some speculate, and we don't know, that we will have... Um, um, uh, changes along the lines of what Sanders and the Obama Green Book proposed, and we talked about that, and that could emasculate grats. So if there's a minimum 10-year term, older clients won't do them. If there's a minimum required gift to 25% of the value of the assets, nobody will do them. So that's why I suggested this could be the last bite at the apple. Teresa, did you want to chat about slide 45? Well, this is something we kind of talked about a little bit earlier, and it's a lot in the same vein, right? Uh, the safe harbor formula will self-adjust. If uh, the law changes and the changes apply to your grant and there's a minimum term, it will adjust. Or if there's a minimum percentage that your remainder has to be valued at, it would self-adjust if you include that safe harbor formula. 
So that's that's something that's especially uh, clever to use, uh, let's say, past 2020. So let's say you don't, um, you know, you have clients that come in in early 2021 uh, or, you know, late 2020 after the election, because we all know that however busy we all are now, which is, is kind of incredible, um, that there are, for every client in our office, there's probably five more clients that are still waiting, sitting on the fence to see what happens. So if you have the safe harbor language and you you know the the effective date kicks in after you've set up the grat and and it applies to the grat because of the date the grat was done let's say in January and they make it retroactive that safe harbor formula could be very important to have in your in your document. Um, these proposals aren't new and we talk about that. So we've already talked about on slide 48 and 49 the end of rolling and cascading grats and what to do about it. And the suggestion on slide 50 that you use laddered GRATs uh, to lock in the current low interest rates, the value of the GRAT technique before it changes. And we've talked about the implications to immunization. Um, longevity could be impacted because life expectancy obviously is more of a risk as you get a longer term GRAT. Even a client that's 80 may be willing to take a gamble on a two year GRAT, but would they take a gamble on an eight year GRAT? Perhaps not. So, one of the things that I suggest you consider is. Uh, life insurance. If you are doing a 10-year grad, why not have the client fill out an application for a 10-year term policy? If they die before the end of the grad and the whole grad is back in their estate, which we're going to talk about because that's not necessarily the case, the life insurance policy in an islet pays off is outside of the estate and makes everybody whole. So life insurance is a great tool to address the increased mortality risk of longer term grads. Even if the client doesn't do it, to protect you as the practitioner, if the client goes out and, and prices insurance and then opts not to do it, you've given them a solution. If they opted not to do it, certainly not your concern. So we've talked about the new immunization thoughts. We can, can, we can skip through that, there's more detail there. By the way, here's another last ditch use of, of grads that I think is kind of interesting, and it's not a new use, but it just has perhaps more importance in 2020. One of the democratic proposals has been to cap annual gift exclusions at 20,000 per donor. That will decimate many life insurance plans that lots of even moderately wealthy clients have. Why not set up a grant now just for the purpose of funding the excess value over the 75-20 rate into an islet? In other words, make the islet, especially if it's not a GST exempt islet, make the islet the, the back end beneficiary of the grant and use that as a means of funneling more wealth into a grad before those um, uh, annual gift restrictions kick in and before grat restrictions kick in. So uh, it could be an interesting tool for islets. Now, we have one more strategy and I think that will get us to the end of our slide deck. Jonathan, you wanna talk about the idea of a 99 year grat and why it's so special perhaps for planning in the current late 2020 environment? This is an idea that was developed by a, a friend of ours named Attorney Berry, who is from Louisville, Kentucky. He told me about this four or five years ago, and I thought this was a great idea. You create a grad, and as Marty indicated, you can have the annuity paid to yourself or your estate for basically as long as you want. But obviously, if you make it very long term, it means that you're going to die during the grad term. What's going to be included? Well, for a long time, we didn't know, but the IRS finally came out with regulations, which is cited at the bottom of the screen and said, it's not necessarily the whole amount in the trust at the time you die. It's that amount which would be necessary to produce the annuity. And they determine that by taking the value of the annuity due at the time you die, divided by the section 7520 rate, that's in effect at the time that you die. So Marty, let's go forward and take a look at an example. I fund my grant with a million dollars when the section 75-20 rate is 0.4%, uh, is 1%, and it provides for me to receive $11,000 a year for my life and, uh, and my estate for 99 years. The value of that remainder will be close to zero. It depends upon the section 7520 rate, and I've assumed that it's climbed all the way up to 1%. When the client dies, what's includable in her estate is the lesser of everything in the trust or the annuity divided by the then section 7520 rate. 
So if I die when the rate is still 1%, we take the 11,000 and we divide it by 0 0.01, which is the same as 11,000 times 100, or we have 1 million one pursuant to the formula. If the grad's still worth a million, that's all I include. You can't have more. But Marty, let's go to our next slide to see what would happen if the section 7520 rate is higher. If when I die, the rate is 5%, the amount that's includable in my estate is 11,000 divided by 0.05, which is the same as 11,000 times 20, which is $220,000. So only $220,000 is includable in my estate, whether that grad is then worth still a million or it's worth 500,000 or it's worth 2 million. So by having the rate increase, you may get assets out of your estate tax-free. For example, if it goes to 10%, the amount that's includable is only $110,000. And if the rate goes up before the client dies, let's say, you know, this is a, again, a 99-year grad, the client dies when, when the rate is, is gonna be very high, but the rate goes up before she dies. It goes up to, let's say, 5% in 10 years from now. And I've told you, and I want you to keep it secret, someday interest rates will rise. So let's say in 10 or 15 or 20 years, the interest rate goes to 0.05%, goes to 5%. Well, then you'll take that annuity, $11,000, divided by 0.05, and you'll have only 220000 in value. That's the value of your annuity. You don't have to hold it till death. You can sell it off. In your grant, you will say that the interest held by the grantor is saleable. It's transferable. You won't make, try to make it a spendthrift interest. So I could sell it off, for example, to the trust that's going to receive the remainder in the grant. And I would sell it off for whatever the actuarial value is, like $220,000, if that's a grantor trust. At least under current law, there would be no gain recognized by me or the trust by buying my annuity for 220000 But now the entire trust will be out of my estate. In fact, if you have a separate trust that's a grantor trust and you provide for the, the, the annuity to be transferred, I can sell it to that trust, which is if it's a grantor trust, will be non-taxable. Now that remainder trust, which owns the vested remainder, will also own the annuity and that should merge into a fee. And so that trust now will succeed to everything. I've gotten back 220,000 in a non-income taxable transaction and everything in the trust has now been transferred out to that trust, which may be for my wife and kids, or possibly it could be a trust of which I am also a discretionary beneficiary created in a domestic asset protection trust jurisdiction like Delaware or South Dakota or Nevada or Wyoming or Connecticut. Alaska, or Connecticut. How many Where are I there live. now? Marty, how many 19. are there now? 19? I think it's 19. So, yes, that's something to consider to do. So before we get off, I just want to just summarize what Jonathan just said, because it's a really clever uh, planning idea. And uh, certainly kudos to Attorney Barry for coming up with a, an idea that uh, is, is, is certainly out of the box. But it has unique application in 2020. If a client has done not enough planning, you could do a Hail Mary of throwing anything into a 99-year grat. And if the client lives long enough for interest rates, double, triple, or quadruple, they may have just moved a large chunk of that wealth out of their estate just by virtue of the interest rate play. So very creative idea and has interesting applications in 2020. So we are done with our program. Uh, what we tried to do, and I'll then let Teresa and Jonathan make final remarks, is talk to you a little bit about the basics of GRATS. There's much more detail in the PowerPoint. We didn't want to belabor that because, as Jonathan predicted, we didn't get done on time anyhow, which we never do. Um, we tried to talk about some of the creative uh, drafting strategies you can use, and we illustrated how you can do that with drafting software. We also gave you some of the sample provisions and some that we didn't give you, Jonathan explained, and uh, if you if you watch the uh, web webinar in slow motion, you you can write them down fast enough and use them. But he gave you some of the concepts that are some creative drafting tools that you should use in grants whenever you're doing them. We also, and that was really the emphasis, was tried to talk about how grants in late 2020 should be used and should not be used, and how they may be different not only in how you plan them today, either a 99-year grad or a ladder of grads, but how you may immunize them differently and how you need to deal with uh, longevity issues as you use a, use a longer-term grad. 
obviously longevity issues on a 99 year grad or academic because you know you ain't going to make it maybe unless there's chirogenics factored in jonathan teresa any last words Sure. Um, it's always good when we go beyond because it's just like in a baseball game when it goes into extra innings, that's free baseball. So if we go a little bit long, it's just free webinar, free substance. I always come at this from how do we draft the documents, obviously. And so um, I just wanted to make a closing comment. I think that's at the bottom here. You know, consider the safety, uh, safety nets that you can build into your grant just in case they become relevant. And also, I'm glad we talked about making the payments. I spent some time at the beginning of this century with the big five accounting firm and their tax uh, state and gift tax department and we did a lot of helping trustees make their grant payments on time or shortly thereafter and so uh, having those provisions that kind of protect the trustee especially if you have a lay person in there I think can really be helpful Jonathan you get the last word no but you you take it Marty uh, thank you for joining us and thank you to our sponsors and uh, um, consider our, our encouragement for uh, our charitable uh, uh, partner on this, uh, the Michael J. Fox Foundation, and uh, hope to see you soon on another webinar. Stay safe and good luck with your 2020 planning. Thank you, everybody.